The summer months are often a time when families travel together, perhaps vacation, a family reunion, or just a quick trip to grandma's house. These road trips can either be miserable or days when wonderful memories are made. What a picture of all of life. We are just passing through this world and families must learn how to enjoy the Lord and one another as we make the journey together. We are taking a summer road trip through the book of Philippians, the book of Christian joy, and discovering principles to help our homes. Let's join Scott Pauley now for today's study. God created the home to be a little piece of heaven on earth. But the sad reality is that most homes are more like war zones than they are places of peace. There's fussing and bickering and fighting and conflict and contention night and day. Oh, dear friend, that's not the way God designed the home to be. And somebody says, yes, but we don't know how to change it. Or we're trying to change it by trying to change somebody else. Philippians chapter 2 gets to the heart of the matter. Maybe I should say to the mind of the matter because it shows us that the real problem is in the way we think. And if our minds could be changed, what's on your mind today? If our minds could be changed, if we could get this, this marriage mindset, the mind of Christ, it would change our relationship with every person. It would change the entire tone and spirit in our homes. It's not somebody else that has to change first. We have to change. We've examined, first of all, that there is, in Philippians 2, an explanation of the mind of Christ. He opens in the opening verse by just describing what it looks like. Then he moves to the ultimate illustration of the mind in the example of Jesus Christ. This is where we left off. Uh, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You keep reading about the exaltation of Christ, and and, uh, someday every knee will bow. I mean, this is one of the most deep theological passages in the whole Bible about the, the person and work and eternal glory of the Son of God. But there is a practical application to all of our lives and families. That's why he's writing it to the church at Philippi. He's saying to them, you need to think this way. You need to live this way. I find it interesting that the mind of Christ led to a cross. Would you like to know the secret of a great marriage? You have to die. You have to die to self. You have to die to what you want. Would you like to know the secret to a happy home? There has to be death to self. I said recently to a group of couples that, The Christian marriage is really supposed to be the union of two dead people. And I don't mean by that you just want to kill your spouse. I mean you have to die to self. You have to die to the way you think and what you want and be willing by God's grace to live every day thinking on the needs of others. This is is what Jesus did all through his life and ultimately at the cross. It's Calvary love. It wasn't self-interest. It wasn't self-centered. It wasn't a taking love. It was a giving love. This is the mind of Christ. Now, for years, I thought that only the opening verses of Philippians 2 dealt with the mind of Christ. And then one day, I kept reading all the way through to the end of the chapter, and I realized something, that when you come to the end of the chapter, he continues the theme. Listen to uh, verses 17 through the end of the chapter. He says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with a father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with you, with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. 
I send him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Do you see the connection? Do you see that when you come to the end of Philippians 2, God gives us not only an explanation of the mind of Christ and the ultimate illustration of the mind of Christ, but then some application of the mind of Christ. There are three individuals in the closing verses of Philippians 2. There's Paul, there's Timothy, and there's a man named Epaphroditus. And uh, just at a glance, you read through and say, well, this is nice. They're looking out for each other. They're checking on each other. They're, they're praying for one another. They're trying to help minister to people. No, let me tell you what they're doing. They're demonstrating what the mind of Christ looks like in everyday life. This is not theory. People think that all this doctrine is just some pie-in-the-sky life. No, it, it works its way out in how you treat your spouse and how you talk to your children and, and uh, how your family operates and functions. It applies. Let me show you what I mean. Paul had the mind of Christ. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says in verse number 17, uh, he was willing to sacrifice. The mind of Christ is a mind that's willing to sacrifice. When you get the mind of the Lord Jesus, you'll be willing to sacrifice for your family members, whatever it takes. And then you've got Timothy. What's the key word for Timothy? Well, uh, the Bible says of him in verse 22 that he served. So the mind of Christ not only is willing to sacrifice, it's willing to serve. It doesn't have to be served all the time. It wants to minister, to encourage, to help. And then you come to Epaphroditus. And what was Epaphroditus? Well, his key word in verse 30, he was willing to supply where there was lack, where there was need, he pulled up the slack. He jumped in. He did his part. May I say to you that in a home, when people get the mind of Christ, it's very practical. It's not theoretical. It's very practical. They will be willing to sacrifice, willing to serve, and willing to supply. You know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like that Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus all got the mind of Christ. And I wonder today, do I have that? How about you? I can't judge you. I don't even know you. You judge yourself today. Do you have the mind of Christ? Are you willing to sacrifice or do you want others to sacrifice for you? Are you willing to serve or do you want others to serve you? Are you willing to supply or are you waiting for somebody else to supply for you? You see, the marriage mindset, uh, the, the family mindset in the Christian home must be the mind of Jesus Christ. And it's not centered on self. I tell you, the most miserable people I know are people who are in it for themselves. Friend, if you want a joyful heart and a joyful home, learn that it is not about you, it's about the Lord. And it's not about you, it's about others. And when you get that mind, it radically changes everything. Some time ago, I was preaching in a church. A very kind man heard me say that the book of Philippians was my favorite book. And at the end of one of the meetings, he came up to me to talk I didn't know this, but the man recently had almost died. He had been six weeks in a coma, and his wife every day had come in, sat by his bedside, and read Scripture to him and prayed over him. Every day. He could hear it. He couldn't respond. When he awoke, he got his own Bible and started reading. And he said the book that he started reading was the book of Philippians. I wish I could tell you what the man's countenance looked like. I mean, he glowed with joy and with the love of God. He said to me, I'm forever changed. I've learned something about the joy of the Lord. I'll tell you what happened. It wasn't just a physical change. It wasn't just that God touched his body. It was that the Lord had done something in his mind. May God help all of us to develop in our own lives and in our homes the mind of Christ. What can you take away from this study of God's Word? Where do you need to apply truth to your own life and family? God's Word is the guidebook for this journey of life, and we sincerely pray that you will follow it. Visit us at enjoyingthejourney.org for additional resources for your home and Christian life. Plan to join us again on our next study and encourage all of your family to make the summer road trip with us. May God bless you and those you love today.